class in the back and I'm um, sorry if you didn't make it <laughs> I told you I told you we'd do this and if you're not here uh, today folks we actually have an in-class demonstration anyway okay so I do actually have an in-class demo I know I'm not done for this so I'm right, sorry to take up the time for the quiz but this is what we have to do and remember I cannot have quizzes repeated I'm not going to give them back because I can't uh, rewrite new quizzes every year. And when someone asks who wasn't here what was on the quiz, tell them you can't say. <laughs> no joke. Um, OK. Now, I want to review what we did last time, which was to talk about the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation, uh, which was, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm already off to a bad start. Guys, you were a little too talkative last time. By the way, you're driving me a little nuts, so let's be better today. Okay, we talked about how um, when it came to figuring out how G changes with temperature, which is like the important dial, and hopefully we didn't screw this up this time. Uh, we couldn't solve it because we had to change equal to itself, which was too painful to figure out. But instead, if I just divided by temperature, I got this relationship. And this was nice. This is the Gibbs-Helmholtz Gibbs equation. And I figured out how, now that we're talking about chemical reactions, if something's endo versus exothermic, I now know whether I should heat it or cool it. Uh, heat, if, um, uh, let, let me put a different spin on it, uh, in case you don't quite remember. I mean, this is all just kind of semantics, plus or minus. I don't want you getting lost in terms of keeping track of minus signs and does that go up, does that go down. Real easy. If something is endothermic, heat is a reactant, give it more, it yields more products. If heat is a product that's exothermic, take it away. That yields more products because you took products away. That's the Chatelier's principle. Okay, now the more important thing is that you're going to see this a gazillion times in this, not uh, after the second test and the third test material, this is almost everything. It just it just comes up a lot that this is the answer to what we're trying to do and then the integration is the solution. So look for that. Uh, the other thing we talked about was third law and I kind of went off on a way too long a tangent and we <coughs> talked about how you can calculate the absolute entropy of something which we're going to do this at 298 which is part of today's big lecture using the Nernst theorem which says that this guy that entropy is zero joules per K at zero degrees for a perfect crystal. So when we make these measurements starting at zero degrees K, we have to make certain that we uh, get a perfect crystal. We have to make perfect crystals, which is a science in and of itself. We actually have faculty who do nothing but make perfect crystals and then do structure of what the crystal is, which is usually a biochemical type of thing. Uh, we have two faculty that do that. Okay, and then I'm doing nothing but writing heat over temperature and integrating it because that's uh, heat over temperature is the change. Sorry, there is no heat, there's only change in heat, so integrating it, right? And, and that gives me the absolute because I have a starting point. And then we have, I'm, I'm going to stop right here. I'm writing the entropy of a liquid. I'm going to stop here because I already talked about this last time. And yada, 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 this gives me the absolute entropy. And I was looking up, why do we do this? And remember, I was saying, actually, let's get back to this guy here. Why did I do this? Because dg, dt, at constant p have to be minus s. So 
Entropy is really important. Entropy itself, not change in entropy. This K L N W deal. This is really important. Also note that um, A is U. U I have a nice definition via the equal partition theorem. Um, temperature I have nice thermometers. Entropy I need to know the absolute entropy. G is the same thing. You see, it always seems like I need to not know some kind of like relative entropy. That's fine for energy. Energy is always relative, that's first law. But entropy is absolute, that's the third law, giving me a starting point. Again, energy is, seems to be this very relative thing, and philosophers even wax and wane that there is no energy, there's only, change in ener there's only changes in energy because only changes in energy can be observed. Therefore, if, even if there is an absolute energy, who cares? Uh, entropy is different. So that's why we actually have gone to the expense of doing all this to calculate the absolute entropy. Now, one other thing I was doing, which I could have done a little bit better, is graph heat capacity. Obviously, heat capacity is very important to entropy. And I um, should have explained things a little bit better. I was looking up uh, some graphs on Wikipedia and just Googling, and I found um, that heat capacity over temperature, right? Remember, we do this at constant pressure for practical reasons. Um, this is how solids change, and then things melt to liquids. And then we have gases that turn into plasmas, but who knows, who cares? This is temperature. Okay, and remember that heat capacity will, uh, this is what I slightly misspoke, but not really. Heat capacities change as T to the third power at low temperatures, and that actually means that um, Metals are a little different, but let's not worry about that. And I know that the integral of this, get, of this guy right here gives me entropy, which looks something like this. And then there's jumps in entropy, and more jumps in entropy because this is a solid. Again, this is the liquid, this is the gas. And I don't know that I'm drawing you relatively correctly, but you get the <coughs> idea. And so, okay, again, uh, heat capacity rises as t to the third power. Entropy actually does as well. I didn't really misspeak. I get these jumps in entropy uh, due to phase transitions. And notice that entropy tends to flatten out uh, because heat capacity over temperature. As temperature rises, that tends to dull the, dull the effect of the question. Yeah, you said the integral of Cp over T gives you? Well, it's this formula. Uh, oh. Plus, right, plus more for um, gases and plasmas and, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, just for me, I, I, I kind of was remiss. I should have I should have shown you what CP over T looks like. This is also a figure, a really nice figure in your book. And okay, I was kind of blabbering, blabbering, blabbering. Oh, oh God, not solid. I should do this. Um, the, the last bit I mentioned is why why heat capacity changes as T to the three. I mentioned how there's this thing called a density of states. And this is going to be very important in 344, so I'm kind of doing some 344 PQM2 stuff. And so density of states, and these were vibrate, these were these uh, solid state vibrational states, which I drew like this. I drew a nice solid crystal, and I talked about how I could get these low frequency vibrations of everyone doing a, doing a small wave, like a wave in the Cubs game, so no one likes them. And, um, <laughs> and so, now, now remember that these are vibrations, and I said vibrations don't count when it comes to energy, and therefore I would say entropy as well. Molecular vibrations, these are not molecular vibrations, these are solid state vibrations. They're the same and not the same. They're the same because atoms are moving around, but they do so with very low frequency because they're in solids. They get new names. So they're not vibrations, they're called phonons. And they're very low frequency, and low frequency, we know our gut tells us that low frequency means low energy, and high frequency means high energy. Just like high frequency light is blue and has high energy, low frequency light is red and has low energy. All right, now, as I warm this thing, the quantum energy required to get it to do this is low. And as it does it, that's like a new state showing up. So this density of states uh, per unit energy or temperature, temperature is energy rises. 
and as it rises with greater temperature, uh, modes like this, let me again draw the solid lattice, and I'm just drawing what one row of atoms is doing. They start doing this high frequency motion, and high frequency is high energy. And so that's the rise and rise and rise, but I can see that once I get, that this is the highest energy vibration I can get. Now these things can still absorb energy and do what they're doing, just more of it, but in terms of the density of space, it comes to a stop. And, um, and again, that's because there um, is, uh, th there's, there's no other way that I can move. I'm done with my motions, therefore there's no new states. And if there's no new states, the density drops off. The density increase stops. And anyway, so you include this concept into the calculation of heat capacity, you get this P to the 3 rise. It explains this part, this was a big deal. And people started thinking about, well, um, notice that these, these things take discrete energies, which we all agree on because they occur with discrete frequencies. And there's jumps, and there's an end to it. That wouldn't occur without quantum mechanics. <coughs> You're seeing quantum mechanics in action. And once people realize, <coughs> that explained this behavior, and this behavior uh, was correct because it explained the heat capacity behavior, it's all correct, that quantum mechanics was real. So as a little bit of an aside on my part, um, it's not important now, I'm not going to bring it up again, but the discovery of quantum mechanics was kind of a big deal. So there you go. Um, now with that, I don't have anything else to say about the third law, which again just kind of just proves the second law is correct because it made entropy measurable, because it gave me a starting point. It meant that I could calculate the absolute energy, uh, entropy, sorry, the absolute entropy, and if I can calculate the absolute entropy, entropy is real. If entropy is real, I can measure it, and I can measure that entropy always increases. And there you go. I, I really don't have anything else to say. Uh, are we okay? Um, let me go backward now. Uh, we're actually, I, I know that uh, uh, those of you reading the book, that's Hank, and Mary, that's it. Is anyone reading the book? No, a couple, no, no. All right, anyway, if you had chosen to read the book, we'd be on chapter four right now. And I better edit that before I get sued by the publisher. So uh, what we're, doing, we're, we're completely changing again. No more gas expands and gas contracts. Thermo of real things, of actual reactions. And all of this is about uh, the third law. Sorry, sorry, the first law, first law, my bad, my bad. This is all about the first law. The first law says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but that also implies that energy is completely relative. So um, I want to point out that, um, okay, so energy is important because it becomes our standard for absolute, um, for total entropy changes. Total entropy always increases, but again, I don't have entropy meters for the inside or the outside. But it turns out that the machine works a certain way, and that therefore I can relate the energy, one of the energies of this machine, based on how it works, to total entropy. And it turns out that the, to that the energy, the right energy, must go down for total, for total entropy to go up. That's what I'm going to use because I have energy meters, I don't have entropy meters. So I'm going to measure a bunch of energy and I'm going to create data tables, which are going to look like this. They're going to be chemicals. And they're going to, uh, the tables will be filled with this and that and what? Okay, so these are tables in the back of the book that you've had since freshman chemistry. And, okay, so those are the columns and here's the row. You have CP per mole is one that you often see. And, okay, and that will be in kilo, what is that? That's in joule per K mole, just like entropy. Now, here's where things get a little hairy. I'm going to ask you this. You already know the answer. But the next entry, is it, in, is it enthalpy per mole or is it delta H? And let's put a little, this little symbol means standard state. Is it this or that? Now hold on one second, let me, let me just carry through the thought by writing G, by G or, or do I write this relative G, what the heck is that? Uh, and I'm sorry, I know this is kind of like, oh, what are you doing, I'm bored. Uh, let's write entropy per mole at the standard state or delta entropy per mole at the standard state. And you already know that I'm talking about 
degrees and probably an atmosphere, maybe, maybe not. Okay, now I just went barking for a very long time about how I don't care about relative entropy. I've done a lot of work calculating through that formula total entropy. Again, look at the table in the back of the book. What you see is the entropy of this, that, and what? And you see numbers. And those numbers are often around 100 to 300 kilo, uh, sorry, 100 to 300 joules per k per mole. Those are just common numbers. Everything seems to want to be around there if you're a gas. And that's, by the way, one of the answers to one of your homework questions. Okay, now, again, I'm looking at the table in the back of the book. Let's start with this. Do I see this or that? Which one is it? Come on, you've had this since high school. Now, remember, I have H. I know what H is. That's U plus PV. U can be determined from the equal partition theorem, and PV can be determined from a freaking pressure meter and the fact that the box is one meter. One liter. One liter. Well, one meter cube. One thousandth of that is a meter. Okay, I can determine this, but what do I see? This or that? The change. The change, right. Um, not relative entropies, but absolute entropies. But when it comes to the energies, not, not absolute energies, but relative energies. Absolute entropies, relative energies. And that's because of the first law saying that, uh, again, there really, is, uh, there really is no such thing as energy, perhaps, only changes of energy. Or better yet, as I believe, I think there is an absolute energy, but only observable, the only observable is a change of energy. Now, let me put this in more. So, of course, this table is filled out with these deltas. Let me explain a little bit better why, because I'm kind of babbling. Let's think about two ways to make a measurement, an actual chemical measurement, and not a gas expands, gas contracts, because kind of who cares, really. Uh, that's for car engineers. And if you're not, you're all a bunch of doctors, right? Not car engineers. Let's do uh, the reaction of n moles of A, whatever A is, making n moles of C, whatever C is. Now, as I promised, one thing we got to get in our heads, so I'm sorry about this, but we have to decide on a machine that runs on certain conditions, and I'm going to choose constant pressure temperature from now on because it's the most relevant. If this reaction, whatever it is, occurs under conditions, the machine runs this, this reaction under constant temperature and pressure conditions, which means that this reaction is being run in an oil bath, uh, in an open beaker. All right, now I'm under constant temperature and pressure conditions. Uh, I would wish I could have a total entropy meter, but I don't, but I do have a Gibbs energy meter. I do have that, and that is as good as a total entropy meter. And that's going to tell me whether this is going to go or not, because it's going to tell me whether total entropy increases. Okay, so now what I could do is calculate delta G. What's wrong with me? Delta G, which is, again, minus the total entropy times temperature, but who cares? It doesn't matter. And that can be, uh, let's see, okay, products. I'll do it this way. This is going to be my Gibbs energy of C minus reactants. And G is something uh, that the absolute Gibbs energy, which would be U plus PV minus TS. And hey, I know S's, right? I measured S's. This is something I can determine. All right, now I've got delta G. If it's negative, the, uh, the uh, minus that is to tell me whether the total entropy change is positive or negative. All right, again, if delta G is negative, minus that's positive. That means that the total entropy increases. That's good. That reaction happens. Okay. It only comes at the expense of measuring the G, the absolute G, no, nothing relative, U plus PV minus TS. It doesn't sound that bad, all right, for A and then of substance C. Or I could have done it this way. Well, let's do, okay, let's call this reaction, um, sorry, let's call this reaction one. And let's instead measure two different reactions, so it sounds like this is a little stupid. I'm going to have A make n moles of B, and then I'm going to have n moles of B, the same number of moles, going to make n moles of C. Okay, and this occurs with a certain uh, delta G, right, just like I have here, this is delta G1, this will be delta G2, uh, which again is going to be n number of 
uh, moles of B of G of B. Sorry, I know this is really repetitive, but I can't really get around that. This is probably the only time I wish I ever PowerPointed this. Uh, this guy is basically the same thing, where I've got products of C minus uh, reactants of B. Okay, now the point of this being that energy being not, uh, because I cannot create or destroy energy, energy is relative, and that means I can basically sum these two things up. And if I do so, let's see, what if I get? If I sum these up, so dg, dg1 plus delta g2 um, is going to be uh, the number of moles of C times the absolute Gibbs energy constant, uh, content, sorry, content of C minus the number of moles of A. And that makes sense because a Gibbs energy is energy, obviously, and it should be extensive, and that makes sure of that. And I can see that this is the same as delta G1. Okay, there you go. All right, blindingly simple. All right, okay, but we have questions, so let's stop for some questions. That's supposed to be two and three. Two and three, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You saved me from writing a handout, right? Two and three, and this one meant equals one. I'm getting a little too ahead. That was my other questions, right? Okay, so thanks a lot for catching me there, right? Obviously, this is that. Uh, there we go. All right, what's the point of this blindingly simple thing? It turns out that we have to think about how people operate. Now, I showed you how I calculated the total entropy content of something. And if I'm going to do this this way, then I have to calculate, again, the absolute G value of everything that exists. And it looks like, I, just like entropy, I'm going to have to do this starting at zero degrees K. Doable. It is doable, right? That would, that would give me the absolute U, T, S, and PV. I got S by doing the same thing. PV is not hard, all right? Um, uh, already doable, but it sounds hard. Now let me point out about two and three here. Sorry. Completeness, OCD. Two and three here. I never had to freeze anything to do this. All this is, this to measure delta G2 and delta G3, I actually can get these numbers by letting this reaction occur in a calorimeter. And I can do that at a particular temperature and pressure. And as long as that particular temperature and pressure, the only things that affect G, G's natural variables, if I hold them constant, then this is relevant to that, which is relevant to that. And if that, I sum these up, I get exactly this. But I never had to freeze anything, right? I never had to go through some complicated uh, calorimetry at zero degrees and warm it up, which could be blindingly hard and definitely expensive. Instead, I still have the calorimeter, right? And I have good calorimeters. But I just set off these two reactions that are probably really easy, and I never had to cool anything down to zero degrees K. Um, which one is easier, right? Note, I have, um, I have the nice simplicity of the absolute G value of A and C, and that's great. I kind of like that. It's just appealing. Or I can do everything relative, and I have to do two things as opposed to one, However, those two things are a billion times easier and less expensive to measure. Guess which one I pick? Huh? Obviously, you're picking these, right? You're just being quiet. More coffee. Porn. Anyway, sorry. Oh, no, that now it works. Now it works. Now I get it. Okay. So the answer is that this is a bazillion times easier, so I'm going to choose to do it this way because it kind of doesn't matter um, doesn't matter what. All right, if we're going to do things this way, and again, this is why the data table, this is why the data table, when it comes to energies, because of the first law, I did not determine the absolute enthalpies. I determined the relative enthalpy and the relative Gibbs energy because it doesn't matter, and one is a lot easier than the other to measure. Now, the only problem is, as I stated, is that uh, I need to make certain that if I'm going to compare things, then the comparison has to involve differences, all right, that the word compare doesn't exist unless I'm talking about two different things. But those things can change, but nothing else, right? Controlled experiments. 
Experiments, a single thing changes, not two, not three, not four. That's ridiculous. Here, I have to keep everything the same. Just I can let the chemicals change, right? Something has to change. I'm going to let the chemicals change, but nothing else. Now I have to determine what that is. So there's actually three things. And we'll call this the standard state conditions. So these reactions, sorry, I'll just toss this up to remind you what we're doing. I'm going to do these uh, reactions two and three. I'm going to do reactions two and three, but I have to do them exactly the same way other than alter what the chemicals are. Okay, that's the name of the game is to alter the chemicals, but nothing, nothing else. And I'm really trying to get to reaction one, A and C, through B. All right, one to think about is what is B? Okay, so I'm going to go through, uh, to get to A and C, I'm going to go through B. So what is B? I want to keep, again, everything as simple and as common, everything that's common ground is humanly possible. It turns out that B are elements in standard state. Standard state. And that means that if I, uh, let's say that, um, uh, let's see, what do I want to pick on? I want to pick on, uh, let's say C is methanol, uh, then B will be composed of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, right? Because methanol is made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All right, now, standard state means that I'm not going to use O as, a lot of people screw this up, I'm not going to use O as part of B, I'm going to use O2 because I can make O in a laboratory, but as soon as I let it out of the cage, it becomes O2. So the standard state of oxygen is not an O atom, it's an O2 molecule. So I'm going to let B be O2 because it wants to be. Hydrogen, H2, carbon. Any guesses? But Mr. Fullery, no, okay, graphite or diamond, or maybe londonite. Who knows what londonite is? Londonite's a form of diamond that's only found in meteorites. You don't care, do you? Anyway, all right. So <laughs> elements in their standard states. Obviously, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen is going to be O2, H2, N2. Carbon is going to be carbon graphite. That's actually the lowest energy form of carbon. So if I, if your diamond ring, um, Diamond ring, wait long enough, it will turn to carbon, just like your marriage. And, <laughs> and then after you die, together. <laughs> yeah, someone's been burned a lot. Uh, anyway, so, so carbon, the lowest energy form of carbon is graphite, and there's a couple of other times it matters. Um, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head. Um, anyway, anyway, I think you get the idea, and you had this since high school. Okay, now I really want to get to delta G because all my machines work at constant temperature and constant pressure. So I want to be able to compare delta Gs. All right, now to do that, I've got to I've got B under control, but I got to think about what changes G and then not change it, right? It's okay to set the dial to a value, but after I set the dial, don't change it. And one I contend will be pressure because. Um, there's two good things. For one, G is, uh, pressure is a natural variable of G. And number two is that G is, uh, sorry, pressure. Pressure is an intensive variable. So it kind of makes sense that if I'm going to do these reactions, I do them under conditions that are intensive. Because if I make volume a standard, a standard condition, then everything has to be performed in a one liter container or a one meter cubed container actually would be slightly better, albeit highly impractical. Or I could have just chosen the intensive variable and it can be in any size container I choose, whichever is convenient, all right? Now, which one of those do you choose? There's actually a third reason to choose pressure. Uh, and we're getting into that. It has to do with equilibrium. We'll do that later. Temperature. Okay, again, a no-brainer. Temperature is the dial that changes G a lot. Remember that pressure changes G, but remember I said it doesn't really, that's, that's the equilibrium dial. It doesn't really do that much. This one, that dial, oh man, that changes everything. It's just a practical thing. That dial and the equilibrium, that's like the volume. 
and this is like the equalizer. One of these is actually practically more important than the other. So temperature, I'm going to hold constant. And that means that I define the standard state. Now, let's not worry about elements and their standard states. I'm going to go, um, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But um, here's the thing that, this is kind of weird, so you've got to be careful when you Google this. Standard, standard uh, state, temperature, and pressure. And these things are the conditions under which we measure the delta G, the, these reactions two and three, reactions two and three are measured under standard state temperature and pressure. They are not the same thing as standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature and pressure are unfortunately different. It's, it's a designation thing between physics and chemistry. It's really stupid. We're chemists, we're gonna do standard state temperature and pressure. So uh, it does matter, your calculations will get screwed up if you look at standard temperature and pressure, not standard state temperature and pressure. And so standard state temperature, um, sorry, let me, let me, so you know what this is. Standard state temperature, guess what that is? Just guess? 98. Zero C? Huh? 298 Kelvin. 98 Kelvin? 298. 298, right, 25 degrees C. Uh, sorry, now you got me confused. Jesus. <laughs> like 98, that's like human temperature. That kind of makes sense, but weird. Um, and then, one, actually, one of you mentioned the, the, the temperature of liquid nitrogen, but when they were doing this, they didn't have liquid nitrogen, so no. Uh, now, notice that actually, see, what I would have done was I would have gone with zero, right? Ice, ice temperature. That actually is the standard temperature, not the standard state temperature. Who cares? Now, notice that, because of the next question I'm about to ask, notice that this is practical. Chemists are actually very practical people. Uh, I don't live at zero degrees. I'm not, uh, I'm not from the land of ice and snow, right? Where I live, where most people want to live, it's nice and it's relatively warm. Not too warm, not too cold. So most of us are doing experiments at around 25 degrees to begin with, which is why I want to bring that up about standard state pressure. Okay, this is a funny one, and it matters a lot. Unfortunately, it kind of matters a lot. You gotta get this one straight. What does your gut tell you it is, which is wrong? What does your gut tell you it is? It's one one? Yeah. Which is wrong. Okay, why is that wrong? Again, why wasn't this zero degrees? Because it's not practical. Why not one ATM? Tell me, where in this earth is the atmospheric pressure one ATM. Where am I? It's one atmosphere right now. It's not one atmosphere here, by the way. Our pressure is slightly lower than one atmosphere. Where on the Earth is the, is the atmospheric pressure one ATM? The beach. That's the beach. Not that beach, Lake Michigan. No, that's the world's suckiest ocean. Right? <laughs> uh, Lake Michigan's too high. It's actually about the height of Niagara Falls. When Niagara Falls moves over to Lake Erie, we have no more Great Lakes. That's why I, I hate Lake Michigan and uh, <laughs> Niagara Falls. I already forgot what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're high up. Most people are high up. Most people can't live on the beach. Let me hold on. Let me back up. Most people can't afford to live on the beach, <laughs> especially if you make a uh, science a salary. So what we chose is slightly less than one atmosphere, one bar. Not the bar, a bar. All right. <laughs> one bar of pre one bar of pressure is actually slightly more or less yeah. less yeah. slightly less. Right. One hundred kilopascals, not one hundred one. Slightly less because most of us live near the beach, but not at it. We're all a little high up. So there you go. Now, uh, once we start getting into calculating uh, how far chemical reactions, uh, we're going to actually use thermodynamic data look at actual chemical reactions and figure out how far they go. And I'm gonna do gas phase reactions because that's like a heck of a lot easier. This is actually crucial to get this right. That's actually part of the equations. If you get it wrong, you're gonna get the wrong numbers. Okay, anyway. All right, so now let's start looking at the numbers in the table in the back of the book. And let me start out with, okay, I actually do have an in-class demo. I know I don't do this often or ever. But I, I thought it'd be kind of neat because it was easy to set up. And what I want to do is start, again, start looking at real data. So I'm going to start throwing up numbers. 
by the way, on your homework, you're going to be doing some calculating delta H and delta G, just like you did in high school for certain chemical reactions. If you don't have the book and the data tables like I just drew, come get them from me. I can't post them because that's someone else's intellectual property. I can't just post it on the internet. It's not, I'm not running a torrent site, right? Okay. And so what is delta H of this reaction? By the way, that little symbol, the symbologies, I'm going to go over these. They're important. I will try to keep them straight. I will screw up a lot. That means standard temperature, standard, sorry, standard state temperature and pressure. Notice I almost said, almost said standard temperature and pressure. That's wrong. Standard state temperature and pressure. Okay. So this is obviously water boiling. And it occurs uh, with, it takes, sorry, it takes 44.0 kilojoules of energy. And that is actually for one mole. Okay, one mole. Okay, so 18 mils, right? 18 mils, 18 grams, one mole. I need 44 kilojoules of energy to get it to do that at the standard temperature and pressure. Does anyone have an issue with that? Huh? That's a lot. Well, now, hold on one second. Think about this. Um, this is basically water boiling at 25, deg at 25 degrees C. Anyone got an issue with that? 25 degrees C. Does water boil at 25 degrees C? Well, then how the heck did they measure it? So it happens with snow. But now, hold on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Water boils? Here's my demo. Not vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, it's deionized. <laughs> All right, water. And so that's my story. Um, water. Okay. It's going to happen, don't worry. What's going to happen? I have to wait, right? Is it going to evaporate? It is going to evaporate, right. So if I have a heat meter, which I do have, I have very good heat meters, I could just stick it in. I may have to wait, but eventually that thing will reduce its weight by 18 grams. And once I do, I check the heat meter and it gives me that number. And it would. It would do that. Now, actually, what's kind of interesting is when we get to phase diagrams, I'm going to ask you that question again. How is it that a liquid is a vapor under conditions where the liquid is a liquid and not a vapor? Yet it's a, it's, it's a vapor. Yet it's a liquid. Which is it? Phase diagram says it's only one, but it seems like it's two. That's confusing, isn't it? Okay, here's the answer, because I can't resist. What's the pressure of this liquid? I'm previewing. I shouldn't be doing this. What's the, oh, sorry, sorry, here. <laughs> If this was a gas, because I, and I'll heat it up, I'll heat it up to 100, and it's a balloon. We all know that balloons are about two atmospheres, right? Because it's a balloon. What's the pressure? I just said it. Two atmospheres. Is that hard? Right? Blowing into a balloon? That's not hard. I can visualize that. What's the pressure of that liquid? Does it have a pressure? It's a liquid. Do, do liquids have pressure? No. They do? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have pressure. <laughs> Now, I know what you're going to think it is. What do you think the pressure is? 118. 118M. No. <laughs> no. One bar? No. <laughs> now, you're thinking that's because, yeah, I know what you're channeling. You're thinking about the time that I said uh, two proteins dimerize in a beaker. What's, is it constant volume or constant pressure? And it was constant pressure because the beaker is open. And that pressure on top of the beaker was 118M or one bar or whatever. It didn't matter. It turns out that the pressure of this liquid is roughly 600 pascals. We're going to go over that. 600 pascals, because that's, uh, that's also known as the vapor pressure, right? So <laughs> liquids do have pressure. It's the vapor pressure in the water. It's 600 pascals, which, by the way, anyway. OK, uh, back to, uh, sorry about that technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> funding from the government and it's me for various reasons okay so okay so now we all agree that this that this can be measured albeit time consumptive let's do it tell you what let's do this whole relative energy thing let's use it and make this measurement easy sorry the measurement's still easy it's just slow like you know it's gonna take days for that water to evaporate uh, but it can be done but I don't have that kind of time. So let's use the relative energy deal 
and, um, and, and, and do it quicker. All right, let's take H2O, and it's a liquid. Uh, folks, when I do these tests, there's a lot of questions. The number one way to screw up is you get the phase wrong. Just warning you, all right, because I am testing you on this stuff. And uh, it will start out, we're, we're talking about uh, standard, te standard state, standard state temperature. So that's going to be 25, and I know to get water to boil, it's still a liquid at 100 degrees C. It's going to take a certain amount of, here, let me, let me make it like, I'm going to make this like a table form. Okay, so this is the certain uh, delta H. I'll write the delta H is over here. Um, and notice I'm not putting a little circle because I'm going off of the uh, standard state temperature. I know how to do this. We've had enough thermo that I, I've got, I'm going to do one mole. And again, delta G land means that we're at constant uh, temperature and pressure. It means I have to work with CP. And it just turns out that I, I, I had to do a double take. It turns out the heat capacity of liquid water uh, under normal conditions is 75 joules per kmol, which I thought was kind of funny because we have a 75 degree temperature change. And um, I, I just kind of was surprised at that. And that's, uh, we're going to do this in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so I'll write down kilojoules every time, 5.63. Again, just use my calculator to do that. All right, the next deal is to uh, boil the water. First thing I know, I heat it up. It's still a liquid. It's at 100 degrees C. And then, and then it turns into a vapor. I know that that still takes uh, energy. You know, once the, once the water's hot, my burner is still going, and it still keeps going for the water to boil. And if I turn off my burner, it stops boiling. Question? Uh, I think you, you might do this. I guess you to the liquid, right? Yeah, no, liquid, okay. liquid, right, right. It's got to get hot before it boils, mm -hmm. and it's still a liquid. And I'm being very absolute in terms of either a liquid or it's not, <coughs> which again, I'll, I'll dispel that um, when we get to phase diagrams. And I look up the, uh, the vaporization <coughs> of water per mole. Okay, again, a little bit more symbology. Change in what and what process. The, okay, the change in enthalpy What's the process? Vaporization per mole. Your book gets this pretty screwed up. But I'm doing this, I, to my knowledge, I'm doing this the correct IUPAC way in terms of the symbology. So anyway, okay, so this is one mole times uh, where's my number 41 kilojoules per mole. Um, okay, I'm kind of screwing up my... Um, I'm kind of screwing up whether I'm talking about per mole or not. But anyway, all right, there we go. And this happens to be 46.6 uh, kilojoules per mole. And did I already erase? Okay, I stupidly erased. Sorry, um, this was 44 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so again, my point being that if I can evaporate water, which I can, it's just slow, at, at standard state temperature and pressure, it takes this much energy, but when I go home and boil water for my depressing mac and cheese, which is what I'm doing later tonight with my cats, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is, it takes a little bit more energy. But that makes sense that, um, it makes sense because I had to heat it up. I had to heat it up, but notice that when I heated it up, that that um, that vaporization part actually took less energy. But it makes sense because the water is hotter, so all that adds up. Now let's complete the full circle again. Remember, my point here was to get to that 40. How did they know that 44 to begin with? Let me do one more part and add it in, which is to cool water vapor. Again, that's not hard. I can certainly get water vapor in a box and cool it, and I can measure how much energy it takes to cool. Because I know the heat capacity of liquid water, and I'm sorry, I know the heat capacity of gaseous water. Okay, let's turn this water vapor, which is a gas, which is at 100 degrees, and let's cool it to water vapor, still a gas at 25 degrees. If I'm careful enough, it won't uh, it won't condense to a liquid. 
Okay, and I know that I know that I have one mole times the change. Uh, time, sorry, times the heat capacity, which I looked up times the change in temperature, which is 75. And again, I looked all this up. Again, I have one mole and the heat the heat capacity constant pressure of water vapor steam is 33.84, and that's in joules per k mole. Right, that's another thing, by the way, to look out for. Uh, that's minus 75K, right? We're going down. And this is minus 2.54 in our table above. Now, again, I'm kind of screwed up because I've been writing really big this semester. If I start canceling out things, what I have is H2O liquid uh, at 25 degrees going to H2O gas, also at 25 degrees. So in your mind, you just kind of have to do that cross out everything and make sure that this adds up. And the delta H is 44.0 kilojoules per mole. Okay, my point here being that that thing on top to directly measure it by waiting for this water to, boil, uh, wait, water to evaporate works, but it'll take forever. Instead, all I have to do is take my uh, bottle of water, let 18 grams get hot, let it evaporate. Again, this is all attached to my heat meter, which is very easy. Better yet, better yet. <clears throat> uh, my skillet. My skillet is electrical, and I have a very good idea of how much... Quiz anyone? Uh, can someone get the door? <laughs> um, oh my god, we're out of time. So anyway, I can measure the heat content going into the pot. So I know exactly what these numbers are, and then I can cool it, which uh, heat will be released in the process, and that's where I get my 44 um, kilojoules per mole. So um, actually what I'm going to go into next time are just a bazillion examples of exactly this. Again, you had this in high school. I told you, this is all shockingly, shockingly easy. It'll actually kind of bore you. What you got to look out for are nuances and temperature and phases. And what we're going to do with this is, as much as this is high school stuff, we use this as a springboard for actually calculating how far reactions occur, which is the only thing that matters, and how we manipulate temperature to get a reaction that is not spontaneous to be spontaneous. That calculation, I'm only going to ask you to do it once. Uh, you'll need a computer. It's going to take you uh, probably an hour or more. I'm only going to ask you to do it once, not on a, not on a, um, not on a uh, test. But just where this is heading is that I'm going, to, I'm going to set you up with a reaction with a positive delta G. If you change the temperature, you're going to figure out the new enthalpy through heat capacity. You're going to figure out the new entropy. I've already told you how to do this. You're going to figure out at what temperature delta G becomes negative. That's the answer. I'll give you 20 points. I talked too long.